Hi everyone, thank you for coming to this virtual presentation about Apache Spark customization and more exactly about Apache Spark state store. My name is Bartosz Konieczny and I, by day I'm data engineering consultant at Okno Technology in Paris. And by night I'm blogging about Apache Spark data engineering, cloud computing, advertingforcode.com. And I'm also teaching data engineering at becomedataengineer.com. You can follow me on Twitter or subscribe to my GitHub. So a customized Apache Spark, what does it mean? So here you can see my subjective vision of how to customize Apache Spark, but generally, from my perspective, we can distinguish three different layers. So the first layer, we can call it sunny layer because it doesn't require from you to know anything or it doesn't require to know a lot about Apache Spark internals. You just define your code and the code is pushed back, pushed down to Apache Spark engine and it's executed. So in this category, you will find everything which starts by user-defined, so user-defined functions or user-defined aggregate functions. The second layer requires a bit more knowledge about Apache Spark internal because your code will directly interact with, uh, with it. So in this part, you will find the, the components like SQL plans, so logical physical rules, also data sources, data sinks, plugins, which are one of the new features of Apache Spark 3 and which is also one of the topics of the talks from this year's Data and Dice Summit. And finally, file committers, checkpoint managers and state stores. And there is also the third layer, the third layer that I call scary layer because uh, you can still customize it, but it's very hard to find the resources on the internet about topology mappers or recovery modes. So it requires from you to dig a bit more in the, in the Apache Spark internals. And in this talk, I will focus on state store. Initially, I wanted to cover the three last items, namely file committers, checkpoint managers, and state stores. But as you know, I have only 30 minutes, so I prefer to focus really deep on, on state store and cover the two remaining parts on my blog in the series of follow-up blog posts. So a customized state store, what does it mean and how does it look like? So just to recall, the, it's very important to recall the definition of the state store. So the state store is a version hash map which is stored on the partitions, the partitions that are obviously managed by the tasks. And the information which is stored is used by stateful operations like aggregations, state arbitrary stateful processing functions, or which can sound surprising, the global limits. And from this definition, there are two important concepts to retain. So the first is that it's key value. So there are the concept of key which will correspond to the state key and the value which will obviously correspond to the state value. The second point is about the versions. So as you know, Apache Spark executes in micro batches. And in sample terms, every micro batch corresponds to one specific version of the state store. And how to customize Apache Spark state store? So to, to customize it, you will have to define a class which is called state store provider. And you will have to register it in the state store provider class uh, configuration entry. And the goal of this provider class is to return a state store implementation. And the state store implementation will have to respect, we have to implement the state store API. And what to do that? Why to do that? So the main reason for, for using a customized state store, like for example, the RoxDB, which is an off-heat based embedded database, are, is related, the main reason for that is related to the performances because the default implementation of the state store uses a, an in-memory hash map, which is stored on heap on the GVM. And if you have a lot of keys, you can encounter some unpredictable load and unpredictable garbage collection poses. And to overcome that issue, you can use the solutions like RoxDB to store your state elsewhere and do not impact the memory which is shared with the task. And to implement the state store, we'll have to define five 
categories, five groups of methods. So the first group is called CRUD and it's very straightforward because it lets you to interact with the state entry. So you can read it with get, you can put or remove the, the states. The second category is about transaction transactions management. So yes, it may sound surprising, but the state store APIs lets you to confirm that every changes you made in the current micro batch were correctly processed, were correctly performed. And in that way, you, you will commit this, this specific version of the state store. The second, uh, the third category of functions is about state expiration. And if, here too, I think that you are a bit surprising to see iterator and get range, range functions that can also be classified for, uh, in, could be also classified in the first CRUD group. But if you analyze the code, you will see that iterator and get range are mostly used to deal with the state expiration. In the, four, the fourth group is about state store metrics where you can define some, if, uh, when you will define the information about your state store. So for example, the, uh, the size, the, the approximate size taken by, by all, all these storage states, the number of keys and uh, things like that, that will be later exposed to you from, from the logs. And the logging will be of course performed by the driver. And finally, you will, in the last category, you will find the maintenance job, uh, which will be responsible for, for performing some housekeeping tasks. And also, and you will see it in the, in the default implementation, uh, it will also be, in the default implementation, it, be, it will be also responsible for perfor performing the performance optimization task in case of state reloading. But I will explain these concepts a bit later. So to start, uh, let's begin with the, the, the very basic operation of reading, creating, and manipulating the state in this CRUD category. And as you can see, it's very straightforward because we start always by initializing the state store. Later, we apply, uh, we retrieve the state for every input, val input record, we apply we combine this input record with the retrieved state, and later we will write a new version of the state. And how does it look under the hood? So under the hood, everything happens, everything starts with map partitions with state store function, which will return a state store RDD. And in this, inside the state store RDD, the state store will be initialized with this create and init method that you can see on your screen. And later it will retrieve the good version for, for the given micro batch or epoch execution in case of continuous uh, mode. And it's, it's called, this call to get store will return uh, the state store backend that you will use to deal with state. But state store RDD is not a single place interacting with the, with the state store. Another one is uh, state store manager. So you, you have to know that uh, from time to time, the state value changes between Apache Spark versions. It's happened, for example, in this new Apache Spark 3, where to fix a bug about uh, stream to stream left out and joins, the community members decided to, to add an extra flag to the state store and therefore to let users to upgrade Apache Spark without losing the state, because as you know, streaming applications are intended to run forever. It, they, the community added a new state store manager that handles this transition and which exposes the state store version corresponding to this, this initial state, the initially created state. So if some, someone, someone started with Apache Spark 2, uh, the state store manager will return the, it will manipulate the state in the format corresponding to Apache Spark 2. And if it started with Apache Spark 3, it will return the format corresponding to this new version. And regarding state expiration, the operation is also quite straightforward because we are, the goal is to iterate over all 
states stored in the state store and apply some predicate on every process on every iterated item. And most of the time, this, uh, this predicate will be watermark based. So globally, it means that the state will be removed when it's older than the watermark of the current query. And under the hood, it looks like that. As you can see, we retrieve our two read-only methods, so get range and iterator. And you can see an um, interesting thing, by the way, that the get range in the default implementation of the state store interface will call the iterator method. So it means that, at least as of the saying, the ranges from the function uh, are not used. By the way, it also shows one direction that you can follow if you decide to implement your state or your own state store backend, because it's better to have these states stored as close as possible to the main memory, because otherwise you will pay the cost of fetching them, for example, from the remote backend. And it may be inefficient in case of low latency, low latency streaming applications. Regarding the third task, namely the state finalization, the workflow is a bit co more, more complicated than in the two previous cases, because once all input items are processed, once, once all expired states are removed from the state store, Apache Spark will call one of two callbacks. And this first callback will validate the state store version. And the second callback will be made, will be performed at the task level. And here, Apache Spark will verify whether your state store was correctly processed or not. And under the hood, it looks like that. So Apache Spark will use one of two different iterators to process the input data. And these iterators are either completion iterator or next iterator. But even though they have different namings, they, are, they have one thing in common because you can specify a callback that will be invoked by the end of the iteration. So when there will be no more new records to, to process, to, to return to the consumer application. And it's the place where the state store commit will happen. So it's the place where you as the state store uh, contribute owner will have to uh, implement the confirmation mark for, for the current version. So it means that starting from this point, this state store is correct. And once the task is completed, Apache Spark will call the task completion listener that will verify whether the has committed flag you saw at the beginning of this presentation. So the has committed flag is closely related to the outcome of this commit method is true or false. So if it false, it means that something wrong happened during the iteration and the callback was not invoked. And obviously in that case, Apache Spark will call abort. On the other hand, if everything went well, for this and for the other tasks of the processing. By the end, Apache Spark will use the SQL metrics that you defined on top of your state store and log them to the driver's log. And uh, to make it possible, these SQL metrics are implemented as the accumulators. So they can live freely on different executors, but when once we need the, uh, the final result, they will be combined by fetching the results remotely on every partition, so on every state store. And the last point is about the state maintenance. So the state maintenance is an operation executed in a background thread every maintenance interval period. And how does it look with the API? So it's very, it's even simpler than previously because you it consists only of calling the do maintenance method. So in the default implementation, Apache Spark will use this do maintenance method to do two things. The first one is to clean up old 
accumulated and checkpointed state because this, the number of state checkpointed state stores must be equal to the number of checkpointed metadata file. Otherwise, you will not be able to reprocess your, your application seamlessly. And the second thing is about optimization. So you have to know that when Apache Spark moves on and manipulates the state, every time, so in every micro batch, it will only checkpoint, it will only materialize the changes made in the given micro batch so that it will save some, it will accelerate the processing, but it can be costly and you need to reprocess your application because it means that you will have to fetch these files, which are called delta files, one by one from the checkpoint location and restore the state store map. And to overcome this issue, to optimize this process, Spark will, every X micro batches, it will take the in-memory map, so it will take all the state stores, all states from the state store, and write them at once to the checkpoint location. That way, if you need to reprocess your, your, your pipeline or restart your pipeline, and the version you want to restore is the snapshot version, Apache Spark can simply take it and load directly to the main memory, to the memory hash map, and not worry about fetching these this small files one by one across the network. And to summarize, uh, there are different points. So the first two points are about the iteration at get range. So as you saw in get range, there is no ranges, even though they are present in the API, but they are not really used in the, in the code uh, for, for now. And the second point is about the iteration. As I said, uh, it involves it, it's, it's involved in the state expiration. So the operation that will iterate over all states present in the state store, and it can limit you in the implementation choice because if you did, if you wanted to, for example, use a completely re remote uh, storage for for the for the state store backend. Well, fetching the state every time across the network may be costly and may slow down your application even more than uh, the unpredictable garbage collection that may happen in the default implementation in case of uh, millions of keys on the executor. The two other points are about, once again, iterator and uh, put method, because both use uh, unsafe row and unsafe row pair objects that are putable. So you will find that in the Scala doc of the path function, but to give you an example, uh, unsafe row is can be reused. So for example, if you have 10 states and you don't call the, the famous copy method of, of the unsafe row, at the end of in your state, you can have only one value, one state that will correspond to the last processed state. So keep that in mind, keep that, that these two classes are mutable and that they can be reused. And uh, to mitigate that, be aware in the implementation of the iterator method and also use the copy in case if you need to store the unsafe row directly in your state store, you can still store, for example, the array of bytes. In this case, you will probably not use the copy. Next point is about the consistency awareness. As you can see, there is one configuration property which is invoked, which is involved in, ev in a lot of places in structure streaming. And it's, uh, this property is called in batches to retain. And it, me it represents the number of batches that are uh, no, the number of uh, metadata related to the micro batches that are retained in the checkpoint location. So it, it applies as well on the state store presented uh, in this talk, but it applies also on the metadata files like commits and offsets. And it's better to keep these two aligned. Otherwise, otherwise it can be complicated to reprocess your uh, to restart your application in case of failure without any problems. The next points are about the state reloading semantic. So first point is about the trade-off that you have to make when you will uh, have to decide whether you prefer to 
right every time only the changed states or that you prefer from time to time also checkpoint the whole state in order to re recover it faster in case of application restart. And the second point is about the delay. So let's take an example, very simple. In the micro batch number one, you create the state for the key one and you delight the state in the micro batch number nine. From nine to one, uh, one to nine, you wrote only the delta changes. So only the changes occurred in this in the given micro batch. And now if you don't materialize the delete action, when you will restore from, for example, the nine, ninth micro batch, you will still retrieve your key one that was delighted. So keep that in mind. And in the depth of the implementation, you will find that both actions, so the updates and are and delay delights are materialized in the delta files. And finally, the two properties related a bit uh, on the explorations. So the state store implementation is immutable. Once you choose in your state store backend, you cannot change it across application restart. So if your application stops, the, you have no way to change the provider class of your state store because it's hard coded in the checkpoint metadata. You can always try to tweak that a bit by manipulating this checkpoint checkpointed file directly. But in this scenario, you will also have to migra migrate the whole state from your initial backend to your new one. And finally, uh, when the get store method is called, remember that the, the state store that you are working on in the given in the current micro batch will be used as the input for the next micro batch. So play with this version number very carefully in the in your implementation. And we are very close to to the end. So as I said, I will publish some follow up post, blog posts uh, about uh, two remaining custom uh, components that we can customize. And I will also complete uh, the things that I couldn't say in this talk due to this 30 minutes limitation under this, this tag on, on the blog. You will also find uh, the um, some code on the on the custom state store checkpoint managers and file committers in my on this data ii summit repo and if you are interested in other components in, or if you want to know how to customize other components i invite you to check uh, different talks that were given in previous spark at that time spark and die summit so from last year there uh, you will find a talk for data sources this year, you will find it talk about plugins that are one of the new features of Apache Spark 3. And I think that two years ago, uh, there, were a there was a talk about Apache Spark plans. And I also blogged a bit about that uh, on, on the blog. So thank you very much and have a nice summit.